Today we're discussing TAE or thyroid arterial embolization, a newly available treatment option for huge thyroid nodules and hyperfunctioning nodules. Half of her thyroid was going below the collarbone, massively enlarged, going all the way down to the aorta. Embolization is a minimally invasive treatment that blocks one or more blood vessels or abnormal vascular channels. Patients with extension into the mediastinum, mm -hmm. like those goiters that are growing underneath the collarbone or behind the sternum in which a surgery is going to be very high risk because they have to crack over right. the chest. I think that in my mind, those are the people that I would offer this. Welcome to Save Your Thyroid, a podcast all about thyroid nodules. My name is Jennifer Holcomb, and I advocate for fellow patients suffering with this very common condition. Thyroid nodules impact 70% of adults in their lifetime, and the standard of care is surgical removal of half or all of the gland. But in recent years, safe and effective non-surgical treatment options have become available. In this podcast, I sit down with patients and physicians to discuss life with thyroid nodules, treatment options, and how to save the thyroid whenever possible. Today's guest is Dr. Juan Camacho, an interventional radiologist at Radiology Associates of Florida, Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System. Trained at Emory University, he has worked in renowned academic institutions for the past 10 years. Dr. Camacho has a clinical and research focus in local regional therapies for the treatment of benign and malignant tumors and developed the IR ENT service line in collaboration with endocrinology and surgical services in the institutions where he has served. Today's episode will cover a new topic on this podcast, thyroid arterial embolization or TAE, a non-surgical treatment option for very large or hyperactive thyroid nodules. First, Dr. Camacho will give us insights on this procedure. And following that, we have two of his patients joining us to share their experience with this procedure. Dr. Camacho, Anne, and Maureen, welcome to the podcast. It's wonderful to have you on again. I'm, I'm really grateful for you taking the time to explain this procedure because we've had a lot of questions about this in the Savior thyroid community recently. And unfortunately, I have not had very much information to share with them. So I'm really excited to talk with you more about this procedure today. I would love for the audience's benefit, if you could tell us a little bit about interventional radiology, that's not a specialty that I've interviewed many physicians in that specialty. And so briefly, tell us about interventional radiology, why you decided to pursue this particular field of medicine. First of all, interventional radiology as a whole, it's a very new specialty. It was only recognized as an independent specialty in the past five years or so. We used to be part of diagnostic radiology. And in order for you to become an interventional radiologist, you had to do your full training in radiology. And then you did a fellowship in interventional radiology, which was about a six to seven year track. Five years ago or so, the American Board of Radiology and the Society of Interventional Radiology decided that it was time to acknowledge interventional radiology as its own specialty. And now there's essentially three separate tracks, which include some degree of expertise in diagnostic imaging, because at the end of the day, that's what we work with, ultrasound, CAT scans, MRIs, etc. So we have to have a base knowledge of that. But the core of the training comes from actually clinical and let's call it the minimally invasive experience, which is you do training in internal medicine, you do training in surgery, you do training in ICU, you do training in, in actually doing the procedures. And it varies depending on which tract you decide to choose, but it's about a six to seven year journey. I was part of the old guard in the sense that I'm originally from Colombia. And back home, there is no interventional radiology. As a matter of fact, when I came to the United States first, I had no clue that interventional radiology existed. I was actually doing my internship in surgery at Emory at the time. I was in trauma. And in trauma, uh, it's a very busy service uh, at a big hospital in Atlanta. I noticed that several of our patients ended up doing a pit stop in the interventional radiology suite to get their bleedings under control. And then they will proceed to surgery if they needed to. Most of the times, that was where things end up. And then the patients proceeded to the ICU. I had no idea that that was a thing. 
coincidentally, at the time that I was doing my internship, my dad got sick at home. He got cancer. So I decided that, you know, it was a good opportunity for me to go back home and be with my dad, but also kind of like to rethink uh, what I wanted to do with my life and with my medical training. And I decided that if I wanted to pursue interventional radiology, I had to do diagnostic radiology. I couldn't do a surgery or anything else. So I switched, 2007, I switched to uh, diagnostic radiology and I did my residency back in Colombia, back at home, so I could be with my dad. But I always kept in mind that, you know, there was no interventional radiology training and I wanted to come back to the U.S., get trained. And I came back in 2012 to Emory. I actually did four fellowships and I did a second year focus only in interventional oncology, which is the treatment of benign and malignant tumors throughout the body, which is what I'm really passionate about. And ever since I've been publishing about it, I have probably by now somewhere around 70 to 80 peer review manuscripts. I routinely speak at the major societies in the Society of Interventional Radiology, Radiological Society of North America. I work with the American Board of Radiology in the Maintenance of Certification Committee. I'm pretty involved with the societies. I'm pretty involved with the research. Academics is my passion. I've always been curious about new techniques, new procedures. This procedure is not something that I invented by any means. And there's a whole bunch of evidence about this procedure that essentially oversees. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the prevalence of these disease. I mean, thyroid pathology is very prevalent in Asia. It's Mm -hmm. very prevalent in in the Middle East and in parts of Italy. So that's where the bulk of the papers come from. I've been doing this since 2012. So let's call it 11, almost 12 years now. Throughout the places that I've been, truly, let's say the workhorse of interventional radiology, it's a simple procedure, which is embolization. We embolize everything throughout the body for different purposes. Because if somebody's bleeding to death, we can stop it. And embolization means stopping the blood flow through a vessel. And we've been doing this for ages now. Just to give you an example, patients with symptomatic fibroids, they benefit from embolization. Male patients that have lower urinary tract symptoms because their prostate is big and they benefit from these type of procedures. Patients that have uh, malignant tumors in their liver or in their kidney, they benefit from these type of procedures. So there is a whole bunch of applications for embolization and that's what we've done and what I've particularly been doing for the past 12 years or so. The thyroid really started when I was at Sloan Kettering. People work in what's called DMTs, like disease management teams. Everybody is tasked to tackle one of these diseases. And I was tasked to dive into thyroid pathology and colon cancer. That was kind of like my thing. It was like five years ago in which probably Jennifer Kuo was one of the first. She was barely starting to do ablations for benign nodules in New York. Mm -hmm. There were very few places doing that. And Dr. Knowledge Service started pushing us to develop this. And Mm -hmm. we didn't have a lot of experience with it. What I did is uh, obviously I had enough experience ablating stuff everywhere else in the body but not particularly thyroid. So I went to Italy for a week, trained in in University of Pisa, or a big center in Italy that does a lot of echo laser cases. When that happened, I started attending meetings and courses, etc. And I learned about RF as well. Because of the environment that we were in, which is, you know, it was a cancer institute and we were targeted to deal with malignant diseases, then we decided that the best option was to just start treating patients with laser. And that's how we started. And we designed the trial, which was a very nice trial, I think, uh, in the sense that we didn't know what was uh, histologically or under the microscope of delivering thermal energy to the thyroid. And mm-hmm. we wanted to look into that. Then the embolization portion of things started because very bad tumors that don't have a lot of options, we started asking ourselves if embolization was something that we could offer. We didn't do many of those procedures, but we had enough experience to do the embolizations and we happened to have decent outcomes. And then that's how I started looking into it. I started reading the papers that are starting to come out and in a multidisciplinary fashion, we started to develop these services. And I think that that's the key. I I, I think that truly when you come to be evaluated for thyroid pathology, I am a believer that the multidisciplinary environment is what makes the difference. Definitely. Because you cannot put people kind of like in a cookbook in which everybody's going to get RFA or everybody's going to get laser or right. everybody's going to 
inflation. So I think that when you have in your same table an ENT surgeon, an endocrinologist, and an interventional radiologist behind you trying to come together to think what's the best alternative, mm -hmm. that's truly what makes a difference. When I moved from New York to here, Sarasota, that's precisely why I encountered the same thought process and the same environment that I had at Sloan, in which it was a multidisciplinary team of people. So I worked with a wonderful surgeon who is Ralph Tufano. He's amazing. And we work with a, a very good group of endocrinologists that support our cause, which is at the end of the day, save thyroids. And at the end of the day, offer the best treatment possible for every single person. And that's how we started. That's so incredible. First of all, I just want to thank you for sharing all that backstory because there's so much here that I have questions about. And it's very intriguing to hear the progression from where you started to how you came to be so passionate about interventional radiology and saving thyroids. And so thank you for sharing all of that. Let's really dive in deep into how this procedure actually works, because primarily what we have talked about on this channel in the past has been thermal ablation procedures, procedures that use heat to destroy tissue within the thyroid in a very targeted way. This is not a thermal ablation procedure. So if you could kind of help me understand the process of embolization, what are you doing primarily to the thyroid nodule that's causing it to embolize. And I would love if you could kind of also take us through kind of a step-by-step -step process. This is Anne's case. With her permission, I, I want to share her images. This is a CT scan with contrast of the neck. Okay. For the viewers who don't understand what they're looking at, a CT scan is images that are taken in very, very thin slices, starting from the top of the head and moving down. And so this image that you're showing right here, Dr. Camacho, is at the level of the thyroid? So this is at the level of the thyroid, in okay. the lower aspect of your neck. And here, what's in the middle that looks like a butterfly, mm -hmm. that's the thyroid gland. And that black circle in the middle is her trachea? Correct. This is okay. the pipe. When she came to us, she had multiple ablations in the past. And you can see this dark spot on the right side of the thyroid are actually uh, spots related to uh, ablation defects. So this okay. is just a tiny little piece of dead thyroid. And this is how your thyroid looks after you do thermal ablation. Her thyroid is asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. It was particularly enlarged on the right side compared to the left side. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, this structure out here, that's mm -hmm. the collarbone. And half of her thyroid was going below the collarbone. Wow. So those are areas in which you really, it, it's very hard to go into. And just right. to put it in perspective again, this is just another projection. This is like if you were, uh, like if I was taking a picture directly of you. And you can see here on the right side, this is the the ablation defect, that dark area. But the mm -hmm. bulk of the plant, it's massively enlarged, going all the way down to the aorta. You can see this. Oh, wow. And so her volume of disease at the time that I met her was somewhere around 123 wow. uh, cubic centimeters. So that's way too big. That is just very large. You, just to give you an idea, ablation is not recommended when you have a nodule that is greater than 30 mLs. Mm, because okay. it's going to be very, very, very hard to cover. And with ablation, the objective is not to destroy all the tissue. I mean, you want to destroy some of it, mm -hmm. but not all of the tissue. You want to decrease volume. Right. And over time, what's going to happen in, in reality is that things are just going to continue to come back and grow back. So this procedure is done through a pinhole incision in the wrist. And oh. we start here in the wrist a mapping of the radial artery and that allows us to tell where we're going. So we go through the wrist and once we go into the subclavian artery, which is the vessel that goes into the thyroid, we're able to advance a tiny little catheter inside the thyroid artery. And you can see here how the contrast kind of like gets trapped all together inside the thyroid and there's nothing else but thyroid tissue here because that's how selective we are. 
we can get all the way from the subclavian artery navigating what is called the thyrocervical trunk and all the way super selectively directly inside the thyroid. And when we have the patients on the table, and this is something that it's another safety cue, we do something that is called a cone beam CT, meaning that we do a CT on the operating table to verify that we're covering only the thyroid and the thyroid only and nothing else that we don't get any reflux of contrast or of particles into dangerous territories. And as you can see here in this CT, there's only enhancement of thyroid tissue because that's how selective we are. And the next step is that we inject these tiny, tiny, tiny little beads inside the artery that goes into the neck, which finally occludes the vessel. So if you believe me, and if you follow this artery, this artery is an embolized thyroid artery. And if you can see all the contrast flows everywhere else, but there it just kind of like hangs, which means that it cannot go any further, mm -hmm. which means that the thyroid artery is completely blocked. Um, so essentially what you are generating it's a transitory infarct of the thyroid, and that's what leads to volume loss, and that's mm -hmm. what leads to treatment of the areas of concern. So in okay. Anne's case, she didn't have a single nodule. She had like multiple little nodules enlarging her thyroid mm -hmm. to a volume that equated about 150 mLs. Right. And that's what makes it so hard to treat percutaneously, in my opinion. So mm -hmm. I think that when you're doing thermal ablation, thermal ablation works and it works very well, but it's about selecting your patients. So right. if I could give kind of like some sort of guidelines about this, typically I reserve laser ablation for nodules that are under four to five centimeters. Mm -hmm. I think that RFA can be used for nodules that are under the eight centimeter mark or so. Mm -hmm. And after that, you're just going to be having a very, very hard time to treat with ablation. Ablation suffers from something that is called heat sink effect. Thyroid sucks a lot of blood, very well vascularized. So when you put a needle that generates heat and you have a lot of blood vessels around it, mm -hmm. then those blood vessels that are circulating are stealing the heat from the tip of that right. probe. And when that happens, the temperature that you're generating, it's just not enough. You mm -hmm. think that you're generating an ablation zone that is one, two centimeters in diameter. And in reality, you're probably generating an ablation zone that is probably 50% less than mm. that. Okay. And this is a concept that we, as interventional radiologists, we understand very, very well mm -hmm. because we deal with it all the time in other parts of the body. Mm -hmm. Like the liver is very well vascularized. The uterus is very well vascularized. Kidney is very well vascularized. So we, we deal with these problems that we understand and we troubleshoot it by doing embolization or by using other techniques that are not so sensitive to a uh, heat sink. So that in a ballpark is how you do a thyroid embolization. I haven't seen it reported, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's other people that do it, but this is the way we do it. Okay. I wouldn't call it necessarily the Camacho technique by any means. It's just <laughs> the way I do it because I think it's the best way of doing it. I do it radial. I don't mm -hmm. go through the groin. I don't cross the vessels that go to your brain, which are the ones that potentially can increase your risk of strokes. That's why I go through a pink hole in your wrist. Mm -hmm. If I'm treating the right side, then I'm going through the right radial artery. If I'm treating the left side, I'm going through the left. Oh. Then we have the catheters directly into those arteries. Mm -hmm. We verify that we're treating only thyroid and only thyroid, nothing right. else. Right. That's essentially it. And you're looking at all of this with image guidance with the CT? All the time, we're doing live x-rays or okay. fluoroscopy. So we know exactly what we're doing. This is like kind of like playing a video game. You have live feedback yeah. all the time of what you're doing. Okay. And when you are selecting vessels, what you're using is 
contrast to opacifying right. from the inside mm -hmm. so you can verify what they are irrigating. The CAT scanner that we do is just an extra feature, something extra. You don't necessarily need to do it, but it's for sure the best way to be safe because that's the way that you can absolutely demonstrate you're not going into a dangerous territory, you're not embolizing anything else that is not the thyroid. This is probably the reason why there's not a lot of practitioners doing this procedure is because it is a territory that it's dicey. I mean, you have to be very careful and you have to have very good technique about things because once you go above the clavicle or above the collarbone, you could potentially be in blood vessels that are going to your spinal cord, that are going into your brain, that mm -hmm. are going into your eyes, that are going into your face. This procedure, I want to emphasize that is very safe when you do it correctly. Right. You're a safe operator, but you have to know your anatomy. You have to know what you are doing and you have to know kind of like the things that you're interacting with. And yes. I think that that's the key to success. And only interventional radiologists would be doing this procedure, not endocrinologists or anyone other specialties. That's a good question in the sense that ideal practitioner that has all the means and mm -hmm. all the knowledge to perform this procedure is an interventional radiologist. There are other specialties that also have the ability to do angiograms and to manipulate catheters. You know, there's some neurosurgeons that do a stroke treatment. There's some neurologists that do stroke treatment as well. Mm -hmm. You have the cardiologists that deal with the heart, but those are not, I, I wouldn't think that those are the, the, the best specialists to interact with your thyroid. Mm -hmm. But not necessarily an endocrinologist or an ENT surgeon would have the same type of skills that you're referring to, to do this type of Correct. procedure. Like a, like a lot of times we see ENTs and endocrinologists who do adopt thermal ablation procedures that are ultrasound guided, but you haven't mentioned ultrasound guidance during this expl explanation just now. Correct. Question has two parts. And okay. the first part of the question is, yes, absolutely. This is something that should be performed by an interventional radiologist mm -hmm. in a center that has the possibility of multidisciplinary collaboration. Because again, it's, it's, it's about selecting the correct patients to undergo the intervention. That's number one. Number two, um, we do use ultrasound guidance, not for the procedure itself, but to get access into the artery. And that's part of the armamentarium of interventional radiology. How would I define interventional radiologists? And my surgeon colleagues don't like this expression, but it's the reality. Interventional radiologists are image guided surgeons. Mm -hmm. That's what we operate on people utilizing the diagnostic imaging tool, mm -hmm. ultrasound, CT, MRI, fluoroscopy, you name mm -hmm. it. We use all of those images to guide our interventions, whether if it's a needle through the skin mm -hmm. in the when we do ablations or biopsies or stuff like that, or when we do endovascular interventions because we can occlude blood vessels, that's embolization, but we can also deliver chemotherapy like we do in other parts of the body. Mm -hmm. We deliver radiation directly into certain organs. Mm -hmm. That's part of what we call local regional therapy. So local regional yes. therapies are all of the therapies or all of the tools that you have to treat a malignant pathology or benign pathology directly in the organ okay without opening up someone without a systemic it's approach it's a local approach yeah. this is so interesting i still have some questions about the function of the thyroid gland after you have occluded the vessels on the side where that mass is does that side of the thyroid in addition to that mass stop functioning or does it function at a lesser level? When it has been published in the literature, it seems that it doesn't affect your thyroid function. When you perform this procedure on patients that have graves, for example, which is enlargement of the thyroid that comes with hyperthyroidism, about 80% of the patients become normal thyroid. One of the very interesting things about procedure itself, this is an image, it's not mine, it's an article, and it's just for purely educational purposes. Mm -hmm. This was published elsewhere, but essentially you can see that your thyroid gland sits in the lower aspect of your neck, and there's four vessels that supply it. The superior thyroid artery, which is a branch of the carotid artery. You have the inferior thyroid artery, 
which is a branch of the thyroid cervical trunk, and those exist bilaterally. So there's four vessels, mm -hmm. two on top, two below. And there's one that is called the thyroid IMA, which is an anatomical variant. It's pure rare. To be honest, I, I've never seen it. Oh, wow. It doesn't, it doesn't exist, but I've never seen it. Me particularly, I've never seen it. And I've talked to skilled surgeons. It's something that is rare. Mm -hmm. So with embolization, your objective is to take three out of the four arteries. And, and that's how it was originally described in the literature. Now, my experience, it's been that the inferior thyroid artery, the one that comes up the subclavian vessels, usually supplies between 70 to 80% of the gland. Okay. Like the superior thyroid arteries, they don't really contribute as much. Mm -hmm. Also, when I've been, you know, after I've been doing more and more angiograms of, of, of thyroids of people, I begin to realize, and this is something that I've shared with other practitioners that have, are doing this procedure as well, is that we have started to notice that there's significant collateralization, meaning significant communications between the inferior thyroid territory and the superior thyroid territory. Okay. That being said, when we embolize the inferior thyroid artery, we're probably embolizing, I will say, between 50 to 80 percent of the gland. And we're just leaving that small residue of superior thyroid uh, perfusion mm -hmm. to continue to be your functional thyroid. I don't know if that answers your question, but normally what we see in the post-operative uh, period and, and Maureen, for example, is a testament of that, and she can tell us about this later. Is that initially your thyroid function tests they go through the roof? Oh, wow, they go like, your T3 and T4, they go like really, really high up. Uh -huh. Your TSH becomes suppressed, and that's something normal. You're creating an infarct, you're killing that piece of thyroid, mm -hmm. and that thyroid has thyroid hormone gathered within it, mm -hmm. and it's once as, as the thyroid starts to die, it starts leaking those thyroid hormones right. into your uh, system. Okay. So it's like a false uh, hyperthyroidism. I mean, it's not driven by your gland. It's not driven by your brain. Mm -hmm. It's just driven by the fact that you're secreting these excess amount of, mm -hmm. of hormone. And then about week two or so, you start seeing a dramatic decrease until about three months. It's essentially a stabilizer. Mm -hmm. Most people are about 80% of the people that are either hyper or that they have normal thyroid function, they remain with normal thyroid function. Okay. The hypo functioning people, those are the ones that we we can generally help. And, and there's a possibility that those people either continue to be what we call subclinical hypothyroidism, which means that their thyroid levels are low, but they don't necessarily are experiencing any symptoms. Mm -hmm. Or some of them, unfortunately, are going to require hormones, but that's just part of their condition. So sure. I've only experienced this uh, a few times, and it's in patients that have Hashimoto's, mm -hmm. uh, which is a form of an autoimmune disease that affects your thyroid. Mm -hmm. Your thyroid becomes large. But it doesn't hyperfunction. On the contrary, it, it, it just functions like a hypothyroid patient. We can get rid of their compression symptoms. We're, we can get rid of their cosmetic discomfort, but we cannot help when it comes to thyroid function. Right. Thinking along the same lines as what you're saying about temporary uptick in thyroid function as that thyroid hormone that was stored is released. Is there anything that they need to, that the patient or the doctor needs to do to kind of ameliorate that temporary situation, you know, as far as like symptoms go with hyperthyroidism can cause heart racing, anxiety, things like that. Is there anything that's done for that temporary spike? Initially in the early cases that I did, and that's why I wanted to kind of like contrast what Maureen is going to say versus what Anne is going to say. Initially, I used to admit my patients to the hospital and I used to put them on a telemetry floor and I wanted to make sure that they were constantly being monitored. Mm -hmm. And I very quickly learned that really nothing happens. The vast majority of the people, they become hyperthyroid, mm -hmm. but it's subclinical. When we develop all 
our algorithms with our endocrinology colleagues, we decided that if the patients have risk factors, which most of them they have, and by risk factors, we, we were saying like they were hyperthyroid to begin with, mm-hmm. or they have very large glands. If they were elderly and they have other comorbidities, then we were going to put them on short dose of propanolol. Panolol is a beta blocker, won't allow your heart to race or Mm -hmm. it won't allow your heart to go into a irregular heartbeat that Mm -hmm. could potentially thread your life. It's a very small dose, not a a dose that will treat like high blood pressure, for example. It's just a very tiny little dose that will prevent your heart from racing, number one. But number two, it also helps with anxiety. Often what the feedback that I get from patients is like, you know, I was doing a conference or I was doing something stressful or whatever. And I was like, cool as a cucumber. (laughs) Okay. Super ease. Uh, I typically put them on that medication if there is no contraindications. Mm -hmm. Uh, One week before the procedure, I continue it three weeks after the procedure. Okay. In the elderly population, what we see is that those patients are typically already on those medications. Okay. It's a very frequent medication to treat high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So if they're already on it, I won't do anything Mm -hmm. except that. Mm -hmm. And I no longer admit the patients uh, to the hospital. I do the procedure and I watch them from two to four hours, Mm -hmm. depending on how they are doing. And then I let them go home. Obviously, all of those patients have the contact to our clinic and mm-hmm. they, most of them have my cell phone and I'm happy to always share with them. So generally speaking, this is an outpatient procedure unless it needs to be that the patient has to be admitted for comorbidity reasons. Generally speaking, I don't admit anyone anymore. Okay. Even if they have comorbidities. I, I mm-hmm. used to do it at the beginning, just kind of like to trial and learn about this. Mm-hmm. Um, because my experience with immunization was in the malignant space, mm-hmm. not in the benign space. I wanted to make sure that patients were, you know, controlled and that, that I could, sure. you know, uh, keep them monitored but uh now i do it essentially they spend half a day with us Mm -hmm. they come typically an hour before the procedure for the prep and all that stuff then we do the procedure the procedure is about an hour long or so Mm -hmm. depending if i have one or two sites then they stay with us uh, an extra couple of hours when they wake up from from the station etc and is this done with a local anesthesia or general anesthesia this is done with a uh, local anesthesia wow. and what we call moderate sedation which is mm-hmm. we just give the patients a combination of medications just to help them relax sure most of the patients they just fall asleep so we've got an outpatient procedure guidance the anesthesia and then afterwards you you said that they're going to stay and recover for just a short time. And that's generally so you can observe them and they can kind of get over the sedation. And then what about when they go home? What is their recovery process like? I usually it's based on on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, essentially the same thing we do for thyroid ablation or the same thing we do for embolizations in other parts of the body. So they're going to experience a little bit of local soreness from that embolization. I, I will let Anne and Maureen dive into that. Mm -hmm. I will say 95% of the patients, they tell me that for the first three days, it's a little rough and they feel the tenderness Mm -hmm. and then it starts gradually go away. Okay. Something typically that can be managed with this type of over-the-counter medications. Okay. How many cases have you done so far in your career of thyroid embolization? I've done a little bit under... 25 or so. Okay. And do you recall off the top of your head the largest mass that you've embolized? I had it kind of like in case you asked that. (laughs) (laughs) Because I mean, Anne's, that was, that was, mine was pretty large. I had RFA in 2019 and 2020 because mine took a two step approach and mine was half the size of Anne's. I can't, I can't imagine how Anne must have been feeling with all that pressure in her neck. This is, uh, Probably one of the largest I've done. This was a massive gland. It's sitting even behind the sternum. Wow. So this is the sternum. In blue, you see kind of like the windpipe. Mm-hmm. This red triangle, it's your, uh, the esophagus of this particular patient. Wow. And all of the things that you see around it, particularly around the red triangle and the blue circle on the left side of your screen, mm-hmm. that is just 
how low the thyroid went. Wow. So just to give you another idea, these are the lungs on each side of this patient's body. So in order to get rid of this gland, his gland was kind of like elongated from top to bottom. Uh -huh. And he was diving all the way down. Yeah. And he was causing pressure on the windpipe and pressure in the esophagus. Mm -hmm. And this patient essentially came to us because he was unable to swallow his normal pills. Mm -hmm. What he was offered was a very big operation, which right. includes cutting your sternum, cracking your chest open, oh, goodness. and kind of like killing your thyroid of the esophagus and of the windpipe. Mm -hmm. And three months after, you can see, you know, how much space now you have around the esophagus, mm -hmm. how the trachea changed from an oval to almost a circle. Mm -hmm. So he no longer had those compression symptoms and how there was significant volume reduction. So he came from 170 cc's almost to 80. So he had right. a little bit over 50% reduction wow. in a very complicated territory wow and you can see it here even better these are the collar bones the ones on top you can see the lungs on the side which are the black things mm -hmm. uh, that you can see on the left side of the screen how that triangle was so small and how the esophagus was so compressed mm -hmm. and how the trachea almost looked like a piggy bank after that the embolization the windpipe became uh, a big circle and now the esophagus goes back to the normal shape and it has so much space you can see kind of like behind this vessel more fat of the mediastinum which means that the gland really shrunk mm -hmm. significantly and this is uh just some selected pictures from the embolization as you and, and you can see like i'm going here into the thyroid artery but his gland in this particular case, it, it extended below the collarbone, but not much into the neck. That's an important topic to talk about. In some patients, the gland grows into the chest. Right. The chest cannot expand. Right. So that's where the compression symptoms come. Yes. When the gland extends above the collarbone, then you get bulky disease. You can see the gland mm -hmm. and, and, and you get the cosmetic discomfort but the the skin in our neck is pretty elastic right. so it can handle a significant amount of volume mm -hmm. in other patients that are unlucky unfortunately and it, when it grows into the chest then it, it's really problematic because you get really bad compression of their airway mm -hmm. really bad compression of the esophagus and the only chance truly is to get an operation with an emt and a thoracic surgeon right. usually a thoracic surgeon opens up the chest and then the ENT takes up the thyroid. It has a very high morbidity yeah. and it can lead to catastrophic complications. So yeah. it's not that you don't necessarily can do it. I, I think that in, if, if you have to do it, you have to do right. it. But this is just uh, another alternative for people to think about when it comes to benign disease. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the key. The key is that here we're dealing with a benign pathology. We're not dealing with cancer. Like people are not dying from this. Right. But they can develop like very, very uncomfortable symptoms. Right. Quality of life is a surgery big like issue here. Exactly. <laughs> And I think that a surgery, a big surgery like that, yes. it, it, it's not justifiable in this scenario. I, I met a patient a couple of years ago, was an elderly woman in her 80s, had had thyroid nodule that grew substernally that was very large. And she did have that surgery that you were just describing, cracking open the chest and everything. Her thyroid nodule grew back on the other side. So they had only removed one side of her thyroid. And she was in the same position again with this thyroid growing down into her chest. And they said, you are not a candidate for this surgery anymore. This is a very dangerous surgery for you to undergo again, especially at your age. And so the patient underwent an RFA ablation and, and did very well. But I I just can't imagine having to undergo that type of an invasive, very extensive surgery as an el elderly person, or even as a young person, when you have the long extended recovery for that type of a very, very intense surgery. So I love that this is an option that patients can consider an alternative to that type of a surgery and that intervention. I want to just highlight one thing before we move on to our patients is the fact that I'm only aware of only a small number of treatment centers that are offering this procedure for thyroid specifically in the U.S. How did this become available at Sarasota Memorial? Did you start that process there? You know, I started the service here. Mm -hmm. What ended up happening is that I was at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. Ralph came 
a few months before me. Mm -hmm. I knew Ralph, not personally, but I knew his name from the Appalachian literature. Mm -hmm. At the time he was at Hopkins and I was at Sloan. So we kind of like knew who was working in the space. Mm -hmm. And when I learned that he was here, I wanted to meet with him and sit down with him and, and see how we could collaborate and and create something different mm -hmm. because that's true what we have here at, at, at Sarasota Memorial. It's not a huge academic medical center. It doesn't have the name of Cornell or the name of Hopkins, but it certainly has a very robust infrastructure and we're trying to be a different community hospital. We're trying to be a center of excellence in multiple different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that our mission is to build a multidisciplinary team to deal with fiber pathology. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I think that that's why truly we don't think about money. We don't think about how many RVUs we're generating. We don't think about who's getting the honor area. We're thinking about truly who can benefit from the therapies. And, and mm -hmm. that's what makes us successful. And that's how we came to to the realization that we needed to come down and think about how to create a team of multiple individuals that were experts in the field. And, and that's what we are doing. Well, it's very exciting. You're doing all at one center, RFA, laser ablation and embolization. And what other uh, non-surgical options do you have available for that's thyroid? Mm -hmm. That's the interesting thing. We do percutaneous ethanol injections mm -hmm. when it's appropriate. We do cryoablation uh, for recurrences when it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. We do microwave ablation. We have it. Mm -hmm. We don't have the exact probe that it's used for thyroid, but we have adapted us to the equipment that we have mm -hmm. in, in do microwave. We do RFA, we have the dedicated probes and we have laser uh, when appropriate. Mm -hmm. And now we have embolization. And in some patients, actually, we do embolization first, followed by ablation, mm -hmm. depending. That's also a, another topic. Like for toxic nodules, I, I think that that's probably the way to go, mm -hmm. to be honest. And, uh, but I, I think that that's a different conversation. But we truly work for selecting the appropriate therapy for the appropriate uh, mm -hmm. patient. And at the end of the day, if someone needs surgery, I'm the first one that is going to tell them, hey, mm -hmm. listen, I cannot help you. I mean, you should have surgery. Mm -hmm. And I unfortunately, many times or more frequently than not, I end up saying no, especially for malignant mm -hmm. uh, disease. I try to be very and particular about which patients should undergo ablation, sure. whose patients do not. Mm -hmm. It's important. You've got to choose the right patient for the right procedure. And here you've got the ability to do that, where you've got, as you said, multidisciplinary team, multiple tools in the toolkit, including surgery, to offer the best possible outcome for that patient in that particular situation. So it's very exciting that this is an option now available at Sarasota Memorial. Thanks so much for listening. Please share this content and help others. If you need resources, testimonials, and support, please join our patient community. Save your thyroid. You can also find me on social media and Substack under the media handle, It's Me Jenica. Never forget to educate yourself and be your own advocate and save your thyroid.